so <clears throat> as as we're starting to get started, uh, I just want to uh, say a couple words that you know we are broadcasting, or at least I'm hosting this webinar from our office in Sacramento, California. Uh, Caitlin Urso, who's uh, my guest speaker, she's hailing from uh, Colorado, uh, near Denver. Um, I think she said Morrison. And uh, from her home office, uh, we expect potentially some uh, challenges with the internet. At least we've had challenges with the internet uh, in the past uh, in other webinars, practicing this webinar and uh, just joining meetings in general. So we are all crossing our fingers that we don't have technical difficulties as um, we broadcast this webinar. If we do, we just ask for your patience. At the end of the webinar, we uh, will attempt to uh, use our video so you can see our faces and, and we can talk to you and, and answer your questions. Uh, there's nothing like being face to face and in this time where we're not traveling, uh, obviously that is challenging and we're not doing so much of that. So we would like to, um, at least for you guys to see us if we can't see you uh, through the video. All right. Uh, so I'm just going to send a reminder to the new folks that have joined that we um, to submit all questions um, through the group chat and message everyone. Okay. Okay, so I guess it's about 10.05. There are still people trickling in. So uh, why don't we get started and uh, we'll continue to let people in as uh, they join. Okay, all right, again, so welcome. I am uh, Nadia Saba, the president of Dr. Greenhouse, and this is our webinar, Stinky Situation, Controlling Odors in the Cannabis Industry. And I'm joined with special guest, uh, Caitlin Urso. So for those of you who may not know who I am, uh, you know, again, I'm the president of Dr. Greenhouse. We design HVAC systems for indoor farms and greenhouses. Uh, we don't just serve the cannabis industry, though that is obviously a large portion of our clientele. We also help people grow leafy greens and vertical farms and strawberries and greenhouses, tomatoes, mushrooms, any plant you can think of in any sort of facility or structure that you can imagine, we are trying to support those farmers and growers and developers to grow food and medicine uh, locally uh, and regionally um, in, in a very productive manner. So uh, I will let Caitlin introduce herself. Welcome, Caitlin. Hi, Nadia. Uh, thank you for having me join you today. Um, I'm Caitlin Urso. I work for the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. So I work for a state level government agency. My job is to be a free environmental consultant to small businesses in Colorado. We define a small business as 100 employees or less. So um, a good portion of the marijuana industry falls underneath that definition. Um, and also, I personally specialize in helping both craft breweries and marijuana businesses reduce their environmental impacts. Um, so I'm excited to be here today and, and share some resources with you all. So what we're going to be talking about today, um, here are our learning objectives. So we're going to talk about why controlling odor is important, um, not just from a nuisance perspective, but also from a public health perspective. We'll talk about how odor control is enforced um, in the varying you know, regulatory landscape, depending on where you're at. Um, we're talking about what we're measuring and controlling. You know, what are we actually talking about? Um, we're talking about you know, those molecules, those VOC molecules, and we'll explain what that means. Um, we're going to talk about how we're controlling odors. Um, Nadia is going to give a really in-depth odor overview of what are all the out different options out there for available to control these odors. And then we're going to close out with you know, talking about the future of odor control um, because there's, there's a lot of space for growth um, and development 
specifically with the cannabis industry and odor control. So first off, you know, why is controlling odor important? And, you know, a lot of people think about odor from a nuisance perspective, um, but not many are, are looking at it from a public health um, perspective. So to back up, as cannabis grows, it naturally emits odorous terpenes. So, the, you know, as, as the plant grows, those terpenes are, are, are responsible for that strong traditional marijuana odor, right? Um, terpenes are also volatile organic compounds, or VOCs for short. So in, in the air sampling um, that I've done and a few other researchers that uh, have conducted, um, the main terpenes that we see coming off of cannabis in, in the highest abundance, I should say, the, the largest quantities are myrcene, limonene, pinene, and terpenoline. So why, you know, why VOCs are important? So those terpenes are volatile organic compounds. VOCs chemically react with nitrogen oxide or NOx for short in the presence of sunlight to form ground level ozone. So nitrogen oxide comes from combustion sources. And, you know, think of cars, um, power plants, uh, oil and gas activities. You know, really in an urban setting, we have an abundance of nitrogen oxide sources and then on the other side of the equation to, to ozone is volatile organic compounds um, from the marijuana industry. Like I said, these come off of terpenes, um, come off the of plants as they grow. Those are volatile organic compounds. But we also see VOC emissions from our extraction activities from our solvents, um, propane, butane, ethanol, those compounds. Also, you know, there's many other sources of VOCs outside of the cannabis industry. Think um, paints, solvents, anything that has a really strong or egregious odor associated with it um, is most likely a volatile organic compound. So ozone is important because um, breathing it has negative health impacts and it's also harmful to the environment. Health impacts um, can range from stinging eyes and throat to you know, cardiovascular harm over time. Um, the environmental impacts, you can see them on plants, as you can see in that picture in the bottom right hand corner, plants will actually begin to oxidize when exposed to high levels of ozone or, or the, almost like visual bruising of the plants. So we want to avoid ozone concentrations and contributing to them. So as I mentioned, um, outside of the plants, um, there's also volatile organic compound emissions from extraction. Um, extraction is done um, when, when your businesses are manufacturing anything that's not being sold in the form of flour. So, you know, our edibles are our concentrates, all the waxes, all of that goes through a chemical extraction process typically. Um, some of it's done um, by heat and pressure or by CO2, but for the large part, especially in the marijuana industry, um, you know, popular solvents are propane, butane, ethanol, um, isopropyl alcohol. And so this is actually a point of state level compliance for existing regulations. Um, you know, states will regulate these facilities and these facilities have to get air quality permits based on their annual VOC emissions. And so how you would figure out what the annual VOC emissions are is you basically just do a mass balance on the solvents. How much did you purchase in one year? Okay, you can subtract out what's currently in your inventory. Um, with some testing, you might be able to subtract out some of your waste pickups um, and then you essentially assume everything else um, evaporates and that's how you would calculate your emissions. Even though these facilities use closed loop extraction systems and a lot of them are rated to be, you know, 98% efficient, you add in operating procedures and human error and um, you'd be surprised at, at how much VOC losses actually occur within these facilities and need to be permitted. Um, by contrast, it's worth noting that here in Colorado specifically that the cultivation of cannabis plants, even when it's done indoors, like in a warehouse setting, is considered an agricultural activity and agricultural activities are exempt from air quality regulations. So, um, and that, that agricultural exemption can vary depending on um, where you operate. I can really only speak for, for Colorado. Other states um, have deemed indoor cannabis not an agricultural activity and that, then that exemption would not stand. So, but for the processing side, this is definitely a point of compliance um, that both businesses and municipalities should be paying attention to. 
so, so what are we measuring um, and controlling? You know, talking about these these VOCs versus these terpenes. Um, and, and it's a different conversation when we're talking about, you know, public health impacts and the quantity of VOCs versus the resulting odor. So again, you know, for, from marijuana, you have um, these, these VOCs that are coming off of it. And, you know, if we're measuring the public health impact and actually trying to quantify the VOCs, we would do that very differently um, than if we're trying to quantify odor. And so to measure VOCs, we basically can take an air sample, um, send it off to the lab, and then the lab uses um, mass spectrometry to basically classify the types of VOCs present and the quantity. So we can say exactly how much limonene is present versus you know, terpinaline versus pinene. Um, now, when you're talking about odor, that's more based on the human response to those terpenes. And so to measure odor, um, typically what's used, and you, you guys have probably seen it in the cannabis industry before, is what's called a nasal ranger. And that's what's pictured on this slide to the right. It's basically, it looks like a really fancy device, but it's very simplistic in its nature. It has a carbon filter in there, um, and you can set the ratio of air that goes through the carbon filter to get, de, you know, to get cleaned um, versus contaminated air. Um, and we'll talk about this in a minute, but you know, Colorado bases its odor uh, regulation on a ratio of how much air goes through that carbon filter versus how much contaminated air is present and if you can actually sense that odor um, based on that ratio. And like I said, I'll go more into that in, in a little bit. So I just wanted to, to mention a little bit about you know, what, what it is that we are measuring or attempting to measure and control when it comes to cannabis cultivation facilities. Uh, there have been several studies that have been done to measure the terpenes that we are all familiar with in the cannabis industry. And Caitlin already mentioned several of them, right? Myrcene, pinene, limonene, these are all terpenes that we're familiar with that we kind of know what the smell is right it smells like pine it smells like lemon it smells like mango right and uh and so but there are some other vocs that are present toluene ethanol that caitlin also mentioned what's interesting is that as time has gone on and as more of these studies have been done is that more and more terpenes and VOCs have been discovered. So in general, uh, 23, about 23 to 30, and here I say 31, VOCs have been well documented throughout, you know, basically cannabis cultivation's history practically. Uh, this study by Iowa State in 2015 identified 230 three VOCs given off by cannabis uh, following cultivation during drying and post harvest. So they actually found 200 more VOCs than what we knew about before this study. What was really interesting is that they ran these samples of air. So they did many different studies. So they did the olfactory study, they used mass spec, uh, gas chromatography. And what they discovered is that with mass spectrometry, that there were certain compounds that were not even detectable. But when they did sensitivity analyses, when they did the olfactory test with humans, that they were very smelly. So here we have this new set of compounds that we had never discovered before that are in very low concentrations that mass spec can't even measure, but that we as humans are incredibly sensitive to. And there are 34 of those specific compounds. So of course, one of the conclusions of this study was that we need to be paying more attention to these highly odorous compounds that are in very low concentrations. So, you know, how do we monitor compounds that we can barely even detect with high technology uh, measuring tools? And then how do we enforce the control of that thing that we can't measure very well? 
this is, you know, a, a big conundrum for the industry right now, and is, is where the research is leading us to, um, is how to do this better. All right, so here in Colorado, as I mentioned, we use the nasal ranger, that tool that was, um, you know, pictured on the slide back where the woman was holding it up to her nose um, as a way to support our odor regulation. So at the state level, um, Colorado's odor regulation is based on a seven to one odor ratio. And so basically through the nasal ranger, what that would mean is you have seven parts of air getting put through the carbon filter and being essentially cleaned. Um, to one part of contaminated air coming into your nose at that ratio, can your nose detect it? Um, if so, then that's considered an odor violation. Now, as Nadia mentioned, the, the conundrum with cannabis is a lot of the, you know, strong odors that cause a strong olfactory response um, to these odors those compounds are in really low concentrations oftentimes and so they can easily be captured within a carbon filter um, and not trigger this odor violation um, however it you know it was more designed for like confined animal feedings and you know those really strong odorous compounds um, which has led to in colorado for the marijuana industry there being more and more um, odor control enforcement at the local level because oftentimes, it actually in most cases, our state level odor ordinances um, will not trigger a marijuana violation. And so, you know, for instance, in Denver County, um, where a good portion, I think it's like 60% of our marijuana cultivations are in, in Denver proper, um, with that, they have a stronger odor ordinance within Denver proper that addresses those odors for marijuana specifically. Um, so it's, it's, it's an interesting situation. And then on that note too, you know, when we're talking about the odor impacts versus the public health impacts with Colorado and the way that we legalized, we mostly legalized indoor cultivation. Um, and most of those indoor cultivations based on many regulatory structures like zoning and, and setbacks and, and um, you know, tr transportation regulations, all of this led into about 60% of the grows being concentrated in our city center in Denver proper. Um, and when we talk about the impacts of ozone and VOCs reacting with available nitrogen oxide concentrations, which come from combustion and are concentrated in our city center, you know, this, this um, issue of ozone becomes a heightened one for us here in Colorado, just because our grows are, are based in the same areas that we have high levels of nitrogen oxide. Um, that public health impact of ozone formation might not be as big of a deal for outdoor rural farms that are away from the city center that are, don't have those ambient levels of nitrogen oxide for the VOCs to readily react with to form that ground level ozone. Just something to keep in mind. So something that's a little bit ironic about that is that, you know, here we have Colorado, it's, it's dry, it's a mild climate, it's a high altitude, it's really perfect for growing crops in a greenhouse, right? So, so we have a lot of growers who recognize what the potential value is to, to use a greenhouse to grow cannabis. And so, uh, you know, they want to set it up out in, you know, the middle of the country. Well, there is a project in Boulder. It has, it has been built. It is operational. But before it was, the grower called me up and he said, hey, Nadia, I just need a gut check. Uh, I, you know, have this 30,000 square foot greenhouse and it cost me about $500,000 for the whole greenhouse, but we want to air condition it. And I'm like, air condition it? You're in, you know, you're in Boulder, Colorado. It's the perfect weather for just evaporative cooling and just traditional greenhouse technology. And I was like, well, okay, you know, back of the envelope calculation, just looking at solar loads. And I'm like, yeah, you know, this is about two and a half million dollars that you need to spend on the air conditioning. And he's like, yeah, that's what they're telling me, like two and a half, three million dollars. And I was like, why do you want to do that? And his response was odor control, that the city of Boulder was so afraid of odors that they were forcing this greenhouse grower to seal his greenhouse 
And so the only way he could condition it was by air conditioning it. He couldn't use just ventilation and evaporative cooling. So even out in the middle of the country, you still might be subject to some odor control um, rules and regulations that may not be to the best interest of maybe some other uh, goals like saving energy or saving water or doing less harm to the environment and to your neighbors. Um, so just a little food for thought there too. Uh, so just real quickly, uh, in California, they do something a little bit different. So in some jurisdictions, they have this odor wheel. Uh, and depending, you know, they're, they're actually looking at what are the sources of odors, how smelly is the odor, what is the concentration, you know, are they getting complaints, uh, what are, what's the intensity, where is it coming from, and they use this wheel, it, it's kind of like their version of the nasal ranger, but they're using this wheel instead to try to categorize the odors and try to determine if it's intense enough or a public nuisance enough that they will require mitigation um, uh, strategies. You know, I talked to, uh, I had a project in Oakland. Uh, it was a, you know, a clone nursery farm. And, you know, clones, there's no flowers. They're not processing anything. They're just baby vegetative plants that are just getting roots. Uh, there's nothing emitting odors really in a clone facility, uh, but they had to at least demonstrate that they were doing something to mitigate odors. And even when I talked to the building inspector about this, he said, you know, he even admitted, he's like, we know, we know that it doesn't smell, but if we get a complaint from a neighbor then we want to be able to point to these different facilities to say, you know, they are doing what we ask them to do. They are, you know, implementing whatever technologies to control odor. And it's not going to be until you get, you know, a certain density of complaints that they will ask a grower to, to do more or to shut down until they can do more or just shut them down, which I haven't heard of anyone being shut down per se. Uh, maybe Caitlin, you've heard of some horror stories there, but um, it's just, it's interesting. Even I haven't heard of anyone being shut down no. based on odor alone, but I have heard of it incurring, you know, really high costs to, yes. especially if you are retrofitting a facility um, that was already built. As Nadia said, if you build a greenhouse, which uh, the advantage of the greenhouse is not only sunlight, but you get some passive, you know, free ventilation um, from the interactions with outdoor air. Well, if you seal up that greenhouse, you're essentially getting that, what we call the greenhouse gas effect, where it's, it's trapping the heat and you're just amplifying that heat load. And um, if you have to retrofit to meet these regulations backwards, you're kind of working against yourself um, and displacing the environmental impact. Yeah. And, you know, I have been to board here at county board uh, hearing meetings uh, here in California and projects were not allowed to be started. I've never heard of anyone being shut down because of odor, but there were enough, there have been enough neighbor complaints and concerns about odor, at least as their sticking point, their stinky point. Uh, you know, there's probably a lot of reasons why they don't want cannabis in their backyard per se, but odor, I think, is one of those points that is so hard to fight against, again, because it's hard to measure and control, that it's, it's kind of one of those things that you, you almost can't argue against if someone is concerned about odors. Um, so, anyway... All right, so then looking at, you know, um, Michigan's odor regulation, we just picked out um, California, uh, Colorado, and Michigan's odor regulations. There's, I mean, vast uh, variation across um, all municipalities, but it was just interesting to point these three out because, you know, Michigan, I, I think is interesting because in my view of it, it it's really up to inspector discretion um, with the way that they wrote their odor regulations. So I kind of highlighted some of the words that are important here. Injurious effects to human health or safety, animal life, plant life, of significant economic value or property, 
unreasonable interference with comfortable enjoyment of life and property. So unreasonable interference with comfortable enjoyment of life means I don't enjoy that odor, therefore it's a violation. Um, so they can be, you know, pretty um, ambiguous language out there down to, you know, Colorado where we try to be very quantifiable by using this nasal ranger, but um, you know, a lot of people, we get a lot of marijuana complaints at the state level, um, and our response to it is that if it doesn't exceed, you know, what's specified through this nasal ranger, which is based on this um, ratio of, of filtered air to unfiltered air, then it's not a violation, and, um, you know, that's where, where local odor ordinances have come into play a little bit more here in Colorado as a result. And so I think in Michigan, you're probably going to see similar situations um, because at the state level, it really is, it kind of leaves it at, up to ambiguous language. So some of you might have seen the LinkedIn post that I made, I don't know, maybe a month ago about this small town in Michigan that is literally arming their police officers with the nasal ranger to sniff out uh, cannabis cultivation facilities and, and to determine if they are too quote unquote smelly and I guess uh, have an unreasonable interference with the comfortable enjoyment of life and property. Uh, you know, when I uh, was talking to Caitlin about this, of course, the first question she asked is, well, you know, do you know what ratio of, you know, fresh air to odorous air that they're going to be testing with the nasal ranger. And I couldn't find any information on that whatsoever. But it's a great question to ask because at least we want consistency in terms of how we're measuring. So if we are going to use the same tools and technology, it would be great if there was that consistency and, 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 and objectiveness as opposed to sort of this ambiguous how I feel, how I, you know, how I smell. And, but that's really hard, again, because I think everyone does have different levels of sensitivity. And so, you know, figuring out, is, is there a percentage? Like unreasonable interference, do we say that it's 10% of people can't enjoy their life? Is it 90% of people that can't enjoy their life because of the smell of cannabis? At what point do police officers, you know, handcuff or give a citation to a grower because, you know, it meets some ratio of the nasal ranger that, you know, we can't even find a documentation of. Hopefully they went to the school. What's the name of the school that you can go to to learn how to use a nasal ranger? It's actually called the Odor School. And so here, <laughs> it's, it's a fancy name, yes. But here in Colorado, um, and this is, this is universal for um, a lot of, you know, mis municipalities that use the nasal ranger, as if you are going to be, um, you know, an inspector that has regulatory teeth, you have to go to Odor School. And that basically, it, you don't learn anything from Odor School. It's interesting, they call it school, but it's more of a certification where they basically test your nose and determine if it's sensitive enough um, to be a regulatory, you know, mm. olfactory sensor. Um, and really what it is, is it's like, a t you know, you go into a room and they've got like 10 different tables set up, maybe 20 different glass vials on each table. Um, and you literally go around the, the room and smell every single one. And you just um, say, do you detect a smell or not? Um, and then you leave the room and they shuffle all the vials around all the different tables and you come back and do it again and you do it about five times. Um, and then at the end, you have to meet a certain percent of odor accuracy um, to be a certified odor inspector that can then use this nasal ranger. Um, so, you know, there is some, and that, that is, um, that does hold up in court. That is a regulatory process that um, is, is enforceable by law. And that's why we have that certification program um, to make sure that, you know, people's noses are calibrated to some level of fairness to be able to detect um, through the nasal ranger, because we realize that, you know, there, there is human error in using this instrument because it's still our nose at the end of the day, making the determination um, it's just a little bit more goes into it than maybe the regulatory structure of Michigan that is injurious effects and unreasonable interference. So I have to ask, are you certified? 
I currently no because Odor School, um, you have to get certified once every six months. Oh my god! Um, yes, you do. And normally I am certified, but um, our reup was at the beginning of April, and there is no in-person Odor School for a little bit. So with COVID, so yes, that is a that is one of the things that has impacted our state and our inspectors is. Um, all of our state inspectors um, for odor certification are in a, on a six month cycle of April and October. So um, we have a lack of, of certified odor inspectors at the moment. So if you're going to be smelly in Colorado, be smelly now, I guess, or anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> so, so something that's interesting, I don't know if you noticed the trend that we just talked about, but it's really about you know, measuring after the fact, right? So, and controlling after the fact. So here are all these enforcement rules that, you know, most of these that we have uh, presented here are, once you are already operational, this is how odor control is being enforced or how they're monitoring whether or not you're producing too many odors. There are, uh, states and jurisdictions that do require odor mitigation plans to even obtain your license for cultivation or extraction. So I don't want to leave uh, that out. Uh, and, you know, some of the things, here, here's the gist of it, is that for the most part, what I have seen uh, when helping people apply for licenses is that they just want to know that you're doing something. They want to see that you're using carbon filters. They want to see that you're using, you know, chemical sprays. They want to see that you're doing something to prevent odors from escaping your building. They, I have not yet seen anyone put a value to whether what you're going to do is a good idea or not, or whether it's going to work or not. There, I have not seen that sort of review or evaluation that says, no, you need more carbon filter fans, or no, you need, you know, to exhaust the air from this area. I have not seen anything like that. They just want to know that you're doing something. And then it's once you're in operation that, they're there, that then they're enforcing, you know, and taking those measurements to say, are you doing enough to prevent odors from escaping? your building. And for instance, here in Colorado, I know that like Denver County, I mentioned they have a more stringent odor ordinance, at, which requires, you know, similar odor control plans to, you know, Michigan's, which their slide is highlighted right now. Um, and really, it's not just a, do you have the equipment in place. Um, a lot of the odor inspections are based on are you actually using it? Are your fans turned on? Um, are you complying with your maintenance schedule because it doesn't do you any good to have, you know, a state-of-the-art carbon filtration system if you're not following the maintenance schedule and replacing those carbon filters once they're saturated because once they're saturated, um, the VOCs are just blowing right through and, you know, you're not getting that odor control. And so I, I'd point out that it's not just about having technology in place, but documenting that technology and then having, you know, mm -hmm. SOPs and maintenance um, schedules around it that are also documented, training for employees so they know how to properly use the systems, all of those different aspects play into a good odor control plan. Yeah, yeah. So, thus, the next section, which is how do we control odor? What would be good tools and technologies and strategies to implement in that odor control plan. And if, you know, an officer or a building inspector or a neighbor complain that your odors are too high, what are some things that you can do to mitigate uh, those odors? Okay, so I'm basically gonna cover five different strategies. There's molecular filtration, photooxidation, mechanical exhaust, basically, chemical and biological uh, strategies. Okay, so molecular filtration. This is a fancy word for carbon filters that we are all familiar with. Basically, these carbon filters absorb different uh, VOCs using an electrostatic 
charge. Uh, the carbon, the activated carbon filters that we see in cannabis facilities are tend to be broad spectrum. So they will remove a lot of different molecules from the air, odors, NOx, SOx, ozone, depending on the source of material, whether it's blended with other uh, chemicals uh, or, or materials as well. And basically, you know, you have this carbon filter. I don't know if you guys can see my, my cursor here, but this would be, you know, really zoomed in view of activated carbon. And you have these active sites and they're all different sizes and shapes so that they can trap all those different size and shapes of molecules, right? And the efficiency of this carbon filter depends on the type of media you use. And these are, you know, four different media you might see. It might be a uh, coconut shell. It could be just charcoal. It could be uh, potassium permanganate, or it could be a blend, or there could be some other materials as well. The efficiency also depends on the molecule itself that we're trying to remove, right? So again, here we have this, this carbon that has all these different active sites and some molecules are going to pass through this because the active site isn't going to be the right size or shape or material. And one thing just to keep in mind, especially during this COVID pandemic, when we're all thinking about the coronavirus, is that the, the volatile organic compound of beta mercine is 10,000 times smaller than a virus. So these activated carbon filters, these active sites are teeny, teeny, tiny, right? But there's also a lot of them so that this carbon, activated carbon, can keep doing its work. So I mentioned it depends on the molecule. Well, this is a graph that was provided to me uh, by a carbon filter uh, manufacturer. And it shows the efficiency of removing beta mercine uh, using different sources of activated carbon. And as you can see, beta mercine is uh, removed very well with cocoa shell and with just charcoal. Uh, and it lasts for a really long time. But once you add some potassium permanganate, it's not working very well. Well, now let's look at NOx, right? So Caitlin had mentioned that nitrogen dioxide is a potential source of harmful uh, chemicals or VOCs in the air. And we see that actually charcoal with that potassium permanganate does a really good job at removing NOx but then so does activated coconut shell. So, okay, we can use that coconut shell for the beta mercine as well as for NOx. That's pretty cool. What about ozone? Well, check this out. Activated coconut shell also does a really good job at removing ozone, as does the charcoal with potassium bicarbonate, but it didn't do a very good job at mercine. So we don't wanna use that for odor control, but we could certainly use that to remove ozone from the facility, from the extraction process, or from, you know, the air outside nearby. So, you know, several of you asked ahead of time before uh, the webinar for some sort of design tips on some of these strategies that I'm going to be talking about. And when we talk about carbon filters, first off, the type of molecule, right? So just mentioned, what is it that we're trying to remove? That's the very first thing you want to think about when selecting a carbon filter. Also, the room humidity. So a lot of these rooms are pretty humid, uh, especially in the clone and veg rooms. Luckily, those aren't producing a lot of odors or other uh, VOCs, so that's a good thing. But that, that water vapor interferes with the adsorption process of the activated carbon. So having a lower humidity will actually provide better efficiency um, by the carbon filters. For recirculating systems, you will find uh, calculators online by some manufacturers. And if you talk to other manufacturers, they'll also ask you, well, what is the room air change rate that you want? Well, I don't know, you tell me, right? Do I want one air change rate, four, 12, 100? Because they're going to decide the size and number of fans, circ recirculating fans with their carbon filters based on how many air changes you want to move through that system. 
And here's one of the limitations of what we don't know and where we need more research and study is how many air changes do we need? We can assume that four is better than one, 12 is better than four, but is 100 better than 20, right? Or have we basically exhausted the efficiency of the carbon filter and the, and the ability to remove carbon at some maximum number of air changes? As far as I know, nobody has done this study. Even talking to manufacturers, they will admit that they don't know the answer to that. Um, you know, for exhaust inducted systems, we also want to think about the air velocity going across this filter. When we have low odor, the velocity across this filter can be 500 feet per minute, which would be typical for any air handler and any filter like a MERV 8 or MERV 13 filter, no problem. But when we're talking about spaces that have high odors, high VOCs, and we're exhausting that air, out of the building, so we're not just recirculating it in the building, it's gonna leave, we wanna slow that air down. So those molecules have more um, uh, residency time with that activated carbon in the filter. So those are the tips that I can give you for now. One day we'll figure out this air change rate and how many uh, we really need. So let's talk about photo oxidation. So photooxidation is the use of very low wavelength UV light. And basically this UV light has enough energy that it can knock off an electron from the molecule, basically turning it into a new molecule and that electron goes and finds a new buddy. Um, with you know, with photooxidation then, we're changing the molecular structure of those VOCs that we're trying to control. But but be careful, okay? Because photooxidation creates ozone. So I would not never recommend using photooxidation in a recirculating system or potentially in a room itself because again, it's high energy UV as well as ozone, which we know kills life, right? We use ozone to kill um, uh, uh, microbes and other things, pathogens that we don't want in the room or in the water. And so if it can kill those pathogens, it can certainly harm our plants as well as people. So when we're using or thinking about using photooxidation, we really want it only on the exhaust stream that's leaving the building. We do not want to introduce this back into an occupied area where we have plants and people. Also, potentially, we can use one of those acti activated carbon post filters after the photooxidation process, right, um, to remove that ozone, just like we saw in that graph. Uh, when, when we're designing and selecting the lamps and how big it needs to be, some things that uh, your rep or that manufacturer might ask you or should ask you is, you know, what is the diameter of your, of your duct? What's the velocity of the air going through that duct? And you should really be thinking about having a length of duct that's at least 15 to 20 feet before that air gets discharged into the atmosphere so that that ozone has time to dissipate. Uh, you also wanna make sure that, you know, the control box is accessible and to replace those bulbs annually. Something else that a lot of people don't think about is just using plain old mechanical exhaust to discharge air from inside the building to outside the building. So if we design this well, we can disperse that air far away from the building, up and away from the building. We can also use certain fans to dilute that quote unquote smelly air from the building with fresh air from the outside. These um, high plume laboratory exhaust fans are used all the time and they suck in fresh outside air and then take the dirty laboratory exhaust air to create a diluted stream of air and then blow it way far away from the building and from the occupants below. At 3000 feet per minute is the velocity that we're discharging that air. You can also use something more simple like these upblast fans that are gonna blow air also vertically at a lower velocity, but also just get it up and out of there. So 
how much exhaust do you need? Well, this is a great question. You know, for those of us mechanical engineers, we would typically like to look at ASHRAE 62.1, uh, table 6.4 for some guidance. I don't see cannabis cultivation facility on this list. I don't see extraction facility on this list. The California Fire Code is now, as of the 2019 code cycle, requiring all cannabis cultivation facilities that are enriching their grow rooms with CO2 to have an exhaust of one CFM per square foot. Uh, if we look at what that is here on uh, ASHRAE's table, you know, that's a janitor's closet, trash room, recycling. There's a few others, dark rooms, science laboratory, um, soiled laundry. Uh, so, you know, take that for what it's worth. You know, one CFM per square foot might be a starting point, but again, I haven't seen anyone other than the California Fire Code require a specific exhaust rate. Really, it's about how quickly we move that air away from the building. We also want to think about how close we are to other buildings because we don't want those odors and VOCs to land on a building next door that might be taller than yours. And also thinking about predominant wind directions. Again, we don't want to be blowing it into, you know, a city center or somewhere where there's a lot of people around. Okay, so then we come to chemical sprays. So you know, these are uh, either neutralizing or masking agents, and there's really a difference. Neutralizing agents are really changing the malodorous molecules into something that's neutral, something that we don't smell or maybe wouldn't be harmful. Masking agents are chemicals that cover up that smell with something else that smells, right? Think about Febreze. So, okay, you don't like the smell of cannabis flower, but maybe you like the smell of lavender. Uh, and so those chemicals get blown into the air. Um, you know, the traditional applications for um, these sprays are, you know, pretty stinky processes, right? Water treatment, landfills, livestock housing, and something they all have in common is that those things that smell really bad are typically acids like hydro, hydro, hydrogen sulfide, did I say that right? Sulfur, <laughs> or ammonia, which is a base. And so, you know, the, the um, companies out there that are saying that they have neutralizing agents, you know, I haven't seen what chemicals they're using but they do tout that they've been used widely and um, successfully in these traditional applications. And it just makes me think, you know, are the chemicals they're using uh, acids and bases? And guess what? Terpenes are neither an acid or a base. So just because it works for those applications as a neutralizing agent, it might end up being a masking agent for cannabis, at least for odors coming from cannabis. I'm, I'm really excited for the comments I'm gonna get on this topic. So <laughs> uh, I just wanna share with you a video um, that shows how these sprays get implemented um, or can be implemented in these facilities. Let's see if it'll play. There it is. Okay, so basically there's a ring around every exhaust fan in this greenhouse and it's blowing right these chemicals into the air to mask or neutralize the odors and when i look at this i'm thinking you know this these fans are on 24 7 right they're on all the time and sure they pass the msds report and they're non-toxic but all i can think about when i see this is you know, there is too much of a good thing. And how long does it take for this to become a slipping hazard because these are oils or essential oils? And here's the property line. How, how excited is this neighbor over here to be having all this spray coming across their property line? Um, and then I think, okay, well then, you know, it's gonna rain and it's gonna wash down into our, you know, our, our streams and lakes. And is that good for our fish and, and wildlife? I don't know the answers to these questions. These are just the thoughts that go through my mind.
Okay, so the last one, just real quickly, because some of you have asked me about biofilters. And here we're using living organisms, typically microorganisms, to break down molecules into carbon dioxide, water, water, and salts. Uh, we can use many different types of media, compost, peat, wood, um, straw, all sorts of things. Um, but there are some challenges. One, we need a certain contact time with airflow um, for, you know, those molecule, for those microorganisms to actually have time to break down those VOCs. We also need to maintain, you know, an elevated relative humidity because if that media dries out, those microorganisms dry out and they can't do their work. Uh, lucky for us, you know, our cannabis cultivation facilities tend to be in this range of 50 to 70 percent. And we also need kind of an elevated temperature because those microorganisms are more active at a higher temperature. But these systems can be very large. Again, they are more often used for, um, you know, livestock and feed lots uh, where they have a lot of source material where a cannabis farm won't necessarily have, um, you know, a const this constant source of, of feedstock, so to speak, uh, to, to, to maintain this biofilter. But it is an interesting idea um, and it's certainly on the cutting edge. Okay. All right, so, you know, what is the optimal odor control design? Well, let me start by saying seal the envelope, right? So if, if we can prevent leaks from, uh, you know, air from leaking out our building, which, you know, we would call infiltration or exfiltration if we were designing, you know, the HVAC system, the heating and cooling system, same goes here, is that if we have holes or cracks or an unsealed facility like that greenhouse, then those are places where odors can escape as well as heating and cooling. So it's good to seal the envelope no matter uh, what you're doing. You can also combine multiple technologies. So what I show here um, is this sort of grab bag. So here we have this flower room and we're gonna exhaust the air through a UV light and photo oxidate the air and then run it through a carbon filter to remove the ozone that was generated. And then we're gonna push it through this high plume fan and away from the building and no one will ever know that you are growing cannabis inside the building. Now there are trade-offs of course to this. I mean, how much does this cost, right? To implement all these technologies, not just the first cost but also the energy intensity associated with running a UV lamp from to several rooms, having this fan running 24 seven at a high velocity. And oh, by the way, this carbon filter has a resistance to it. And so it's gonna increase the static pressure on your fan, which means you're gonna need a more powerful fan. So not only is this, you know, a very expensive solution in terms of CapEx, but also, you know, is gonna have a pretty significant operating expense associated with it. But if you really want, to prevent odors from escaping your building, you seal that envelope and you combine multiple technologies. Also, of course, practicing regular maintenance, so changing out those bulbs, changing out the carbon filters, and making sure that everything is working as intended. Uh, and you can also schedule high em emitting activities in the evening. Uh, Caitlin's gonna talk a little bit more about this, but you know, those of us who have experience with cannabis facility, we know, with facilities, we know that Harvesting is a high emitting activity, right? Because we're, we're disrupting those flowers and so it's emitting those VOCs and those odors. Same with trimming. Everyone knows when they walk up to a cannabis facility or they're working in one that they know the day that people are trimming because it smells. So if you can schedule those activities in the evening when maybe pe other people, other businesses aren't open and they're not gonna complain about the odors or maybe you know there's less UV light from the sun that's creating ozone, um, that would be a great strategy to implement. That's not technology, that's just about scheduling and operations. Yeah, so here in Colorado, to give you an example of what that looks like, is um, we have some meteorologists on staff at the air, state level air division that, that kind of monitor both weather patterns and um, 
you know, ozone, resulting ozone concentrations and kind of pre can predict for different areas of the state, you know, when is going to be a high ozone day. Um, and so we can set people up on email alert systems to let them know, you know, a couple days ahead of time, you know, maybe today's Tuesday, so maybe on Friday we're going to have a high ozone day and we send out that alert, then those businesses can make operational decisions to schedule their activities around those high ozone days voluntarily and if they can make it work, you know, can they move on Friday if it's going to be a really high ozone day, it's going to be, you know, 80 degrees, not windy, just really sunny, um, you know, it's a high commuter day, that kind of thing, you know, high ozone potential. Can we move our harvesting activities, you know, to a different day or can we move them instead of first thing in the morning, can we move them into the evening so that those VOC emissions don't have all day to bake in the sun and create ozone formation, they can kind of dissipate and disperse overnight. Um, so yeah, that's that's one thing to to consider with ozone is it's not only you know scheduling things in the evening, but on different days and paying attention to your local you know air quality forecast and, and when are you, when is your business going to have the highest impact? Um, another best practice that we kind of point out with the seasonality of ozone is ozone season is May through September because it's it's highly dependent on sunlight and the availability of sunlight as well as pollutants and so. Um, you know, if you have a filter, a carbon filter maintenance schedule and say, you know, you're a smaller facility and you only need to replace your filters once a year, can you do it at the beginning of May so that that filter has the highest filter efficiency through those summer months um, where controlling the VOCs has a uh, heightened um, public health impacts because of the potential for ozone formation. And then when maybe filter efficiency drops off in the winter months and you're still controlling your odors, but they're maybe not as efficient, as efficient, um, it's not as big of a deal. That's awesome. Those are really good tips. So talking about the future of, of odor control, um, we definitely need more data and research. Um, and that's, I, I'm conducting some research myself right now. Um, we certainly need, you know, new and specialized technologies. Um, we also need kind of an, an evolution of regulatory structure as well. And, and also understanding best practices and, you know, when our businesses is having the highest impact and all of that. Um, and, you know, can we take this human subjectivity out of the equation? Can we avoid, you know, regulatory structures like Michigan, where it's kind of, you know, more up to inspectors discretion or, you know, on the other side of the spectrum, how in Colorado, yes, we have a quantifiable odor control ordinance, but it's not stringent enough to address the marijuana industry or a lot of other industries um, for that matter. So just keeping all of that in mind. Um, so I'm excited to share with you that I am um, the project manager um, for an air quality study that's being conducted by my organization, Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. Um, we got $31,000 in funding to collect samples um, at cannabis cultivation facilities. We collected them at four commercial cannabis cultivation facilities, um, indoor cultivation facilities, because that's what's common in Colorado. Um, you know, we paid attention to facilities that are in our ozone non-attainment area, which is basically, you know, the, um, the most populous area of our state, the Denver metro area and, you know, kind of front range area where we're not meeting ozone standards. And that's um, largely where most of our cannabis cultivations are located as well. So we wanted to look into, you know, what is the cannabis industry's influence on ozone formation? And to answer that question, we had the first answer how many pounds of VOCs are being produced from a pound of marijuana? Um, and, and realizing that that rate of VOC emissions changes um, throughout the different activities within a cultivation facility. So we collected samples um, throughout the cultivation facility in the clone rooms where the plants are just, you know, barely babies. Um, then in the bedroom, which is, you know, uh, early, early stage plants that haven't been triggered into flowering um, yet. And then also within the flowering rooms, you know, late stage of the plants right before harvest. Um, we took samples during harvesting and trimming activities as well. Um, and then we also took uh, pre and post filtration, um, well, basically exhaust point samples, I would say pre and post filtration were available. Not all facilities had um, odor controls that we sampled at currently. Um, 
to really get an idea of not only what are what is the marijuana industry's you know overall contri contribution to ozone formation but how do these different voc profiles vary within a commercial cultivation environment um, which i feel is one great advantage of this study compared to some of the other studies that have been done is this is actually done in a production facility these plants are growing in an optimal environment um, you know they're producing high quality, high um, producing, you know, plants versus, you know, scientists growing the plants on their own. And, um, and then also, you know, just the intensity of having, you know, some of the, the rooms we took samples in had, you know, 2000 plants with 40 different um, cannabis strains. So we had a really good variety within them um, as well. And so, you know, no study is going to be perfect because this was four facilities and four, you know, each facility is very unique. Um, keep in mind that each cannabis plant is unique and each um, terpene profile is going to vary differently. I mean, if you um, have spent some time around cannabis, especially, you know, high-end marijuana products, you're going to realize that not all plants smell the same. They don't all just smell like marijuana. Some of them smell like lemon versus some of them smell like pine. Some smell like grapes or cheese. So they have very different terpene profiles per strain of cannabis. And so with this study, we really tried to do our best to um, capture all of those different factors and come up with a, you know, a VOC emission rate and then model those, you know, impacts on ozone formation, specifically in Colorado. Um, to let you guys know where we're at with the study is, um, you know, we hope to publish results uh, this fall. Um, originally, we were scheduled to publish this summer, but our modeling got pushed back um, with the, the COVID outbreak. And so we've got to wait on, on some of more of our analysis to be done it was delayed because of um, the current virus outbreak. But we are on track to, um, at this point to publish our results this fall. Um, you know, I'm ambitious that it will be October, it could be November, um, but, but keep an eye out for those results. And actually, we're going to be publishing the exhaust results first, um, because those are what's going to have an influence on ozone formation and kind of the resulting ozone modeling. And then um, next year is when I will be going back through the data and kind of publishing the internal results for VOC concentrations within, you know, clone versus veg versus flower rooms, all those different um, activities that will be more important to learn uh, for the industry to learn from. It, it was interesting to me when you mentioned about, you know, anyone who is um, familiar with cannabis or who even purchases high-end cannabis. I mean, something that those people look for are those odors, right? Like they want it to smell like pine. They want it to smell like lemon. Yeah, that's what creates a craft cannabis product. Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, something that might be foul smelling to one person is exactly what uh, someone else is looking for. Um, and so. also too, that, that translates over to the extraction processes as well. You know, when I was new to the, the cannabis industry and I was kind of naive to operations and, and consumer um, drivers and things like that, and I saw extraction facilities, I went, why doesn't everybody do CO2 extraction? Um, and I had somebody who was a little bit more marijuana savvy explain to me that CO2 extraction is what would be, you know, in the alcohol industry compared to F, um, Everclear. You know, it's it's all the all, all the punch. Um, it's just the cannabinoids. It's just the THC. But when you use solvents like propane and butane and ethanol and isopropyl alcohol for extraction, you get those terpene profiles that pull through into the concentrates. And so that would be more akin to like, you know, fine wine or craft beer for consumers. And so you know, the market drivers are also what's driving some of the um, pollution associated with the processes. Well, I just learned something. <laughs> I've learned a lot, but that was, I didn't know that about CO2 versus the solvents. Yes. Um, that's why CO2 extraction is more popular for hemp plants because in hemp extraction, you're only interested in extracting those CBD cannabinoids. Um, I don't believe that that the the hemp consumer market has moved into terpene profiles or you know whole plants um you know they're really just focused on how many molecules of cbd cannabinoids can i get out of it and that that's why um, co2 can be highly efficient at that if you're not looking for that whole plant um, effect um, 
yeah, I could, I could talk about all that stuff forever, <laughs> but we're getting off topic and yeah. also we're running over time. So um, one last thing that I wanted to point out to you guys as, as that goes along with um, the research that I'm conducting and, and previous research that has been done is that, you know, the VOC profile kind of increases with the, the life cycle or the process of the plant. So very low VOCs and clone in the bedrooms, um, you know, I, I'd say not, not really a concern. Flower room, you start to see the VOC profile increase. Um, you definitely notice it more in, you know, in your nose and, and closer to harvest, those VOC emissions are going to increase closer to harvest as those flowers mature, just like with any other flower, you know, the, the flower doesn't really start to have that floral smell until it has a bloom on it and that, that smell develops with the bloom. Um, then it, those VOC emissions definitely increase in the drying and curing process, right? As the plants are being dried out, more of those terpenes are escaping, um, you know, with the, the humidity of the plant. And so you're gonna see VOCs coming off of that. And then, um, you know, the highest VOC activities are gonna be the processing. So when you're actually cutting those plants up, sending them through um, the trimming machines, um, you know, it's, it's cute that we see a, a hand trimmer on this photo. That's not the reality in a cannabis uh, production facility. Um, you're definitely going to have, you know, 10 auto trimmers lined up with plant material flying all over the place. Um, very rarely are you going to see this cute boutique trimming going on. <laughs> and then also... Hey, you just made an argument for craft cannabis, you know, I mean, I'm yeah. just trying to help you out here. <laughs> there we go. Um, and then in the extraction facilities, um, you know, you're going to have more of those uh, solvents escaping along with the terpene profiles of just agitating the plants. You're putting those plants under, that plant material under heat and pressure um, and then you're adding solvents to further extract things out. You're just agitating that plant further so that those VOCs that are retained within the plant um, are being emitted, if you can kind of think about it that way. And, and as Nadia stated too, I mean, if you've been around cannabis cultivation facilities, you know what day is harvest day. Um, it's very obvious. Yeah. And also too, um, most facilities, you know, when they're designing odor controls, they're designing odor controls for their um, you know, their ambient load, their, their main cultivation load, um, their oftentimes odor control systems will be overwhelmed on harvest days. And that's just something that isn't really, you know, really avoidable. Mm -hmm. You know, and something that I've seen in trim rooms, unfortunately, at least the, the, the hand trim rooms, I, I will um, make that qualification that there are carbon filters in there, but those fans are noisy. They are loud. And hand trimmers, they want to listen to music um, or it's just those fans are so outrageously loud that they will turn those carbon fans and filters off. And so what do we do in that situation, right? There has to be another way that we want to control odors um, during that trimming process uh, when we know that they're going to turn off the technology that we um, installed for them. But so, um, you know, just some, some final conclusions, thoughts. Uh, thank you for sticking with us after 11 o'clock. But, you know, we just want to say that not all VOCs are created equal. Uh, it's been really interesting watching the comments and uh, how much, Caitlin, you stirred up uh, the discussion on ozone and VOCs that aren't necessarily odors. So I'm really glad that you presented that. Right? Is it is it a nuisance or is it a, a hazard to our health? Also, you know, are these VOCs in high or low concentrations? Are they really smelly or not smelly? Just because something's in high concentration doesn't mean we can smell it, and just because something's a low concentration doesn't mean we can't. And so, finding better ways to document uh, what those VOCs are and what it is that we really need to control is really important for moving the technology uh, forward and the strategies forward. Um, and, you know, we really just need a lot more research like what Caitlin is doing to document VOCs that are generated throughout the entire process and identifying which of those terpenes and which of those VOCs uh, might contribute to those other health um, uh, harmful uh you know, ozone and NOx and, and harmful compounds out there and which are more 
benign. Uh, and ultimately, we need more customized technology and the design of that technology and implementation of it to control the VOCs that we really want and need to control. Uh, and, and remember that there are trade-offs that, you know, okay, here we have a technology that works well at breaking up odors, but it produces ozone. So what do we do to then mitigate that? or uh, we have a very high energy intensive greenhouse that could have been very cheap to operate because we sealed that greenhouse and air conditioned it. Um, and, and all the other strategies that were discussed today that you know there might be an environmental or energy or water impact um, based on the strategy or technology that you implement. So we and want I to be thinking about all of that. Yeah, and I just want to chime in too, and um, you know, based on some of the chat that's been going on um, throughout the presentation, I, I kind of wanted to highlight one thing, and that you know, why are we picking on cannabis versus <laughs> indoor tomatoes or orchid farms, or you know, there's there's lots of other indoor cultivation that's happening out there, and you know, why are cannabis odors kind of being picked on, and you know, yes, they are traditionally maybe more egregious that's open to opinion than, than others. Um, but one thing to point out that is the, the large differentiator, I think in my mind is profit margin. Um, that is driving this indoor cultivation in urban environments. Um, this odor becomes more of a problem because no other plant out there would have the profit margins for us to be growing it in concentrated urban areas. You know, We would never be growing tomatoes downtown next to you know, our football stadiums and our baseball stadiums like we do with cannabis. And so that profit margin drives what's traditionally an agricultural activity into an urban environment. And if we did that with any other agricultural industry where, you know, if we started putting, you know, raising a cows in the middle of, of the, the urban environment, we would get just as much scrutiny and odor control. So I, I really try to point that out to the cannabis industry is, you know, what makes them unique? Why are they being picked on? Well, it's the way that they decided to operate and the profit margins that drive them into those mm -hmm. operations. And those other agricultural operations or food processing operations aren't exempt from that either. I mean, just because, you know, we have been encroaching on the outskirts of town. So some of you might remember a couple years ago, the Sriracha frat factory in uh, Southern California that was there for a really long time. And then all of a sudden everyone started complaining about it. Why did that all of a sudden happen? Uh, that building inspector that I talked to in Oakland, he mentioned that you know a Pete's coffee roaster was shut down also in the area because people complained about the smell of roasting coffee. I can't even understand what that. We had means. a soup factory shut down um, here in Colorado for the smell of, of soup, and it was high enough to cause an odor violation over the seven to one ratio. We mix all yeah. those onions and everything in there. It can right. Get smelly. <laughs> Right. The closer we get to mushroom farms and hog farms and poultry farms and all these other farms that do produce odors that we don't like, um, you know, they do have to mitigate odors. They are implementing these technologies, uh, maybe not all of them, but some of them. And, uh, you know, certainly agricultural engineers have been dealing with odor issues for a long time. And when I went to the American Society for Agricultural and Biological Engineers conference last summer, I sat in on a session just talking about odor control for agriculture facilities because I wanted to see what they were doing that maybe we could implement here. Um, and I'll tell you, they're asking all the same questions. Nobody has this figured out. So, um, you know, there is a lot of opportunity to, uh, to develop technologies and do research in this field that could apply to many other applications. Absolutely. So I would say the take homes are, you know, more data, increased specific <laughs> technology specific to the needs of the cannabis industry and the terpene profiles that they create. And then also, you know, when you're looking at odor control systems, realize what your priority is. Is your focus really just odor? or are VOCs coming into play? Where are you located? Are you in an urban environment that ozone is a great concern? 
if that's the case, you probably should not put masking agents spraying outside of your facility that are another source of VOCs as your practice. You know, maybe you opt for carbon filtration, which controls both the odor and the VOCs. So uh, that concludes uh, our webinar. We're going to stick around for, you know, maybe another 10 minutes or as long as people have questions. If you want to ask some questions live right now, um, you know, we'll, we'll be here. I'm going to try the video there just for me and Caitlin. So um, no guarantees that we will be able to keep the connection, <laughs> um, but let's, let's go for it. Why not? All right. Work with us, Zoom. You can do it. Okay. I think you can see me. Um, but yeah, open it up to questions. I think most of the questions that came through chat, I was able to um, kind of respond to in, in live manage. But if anyone wants clarity on those questions that we respond to um, via chat or would like Nadia to weigh in on them, feel free to ask them again. Um, Nadia, can you unmute the group so they can? Yeah, sure. Maybe. Good luck. All right, you guys should be able to unmute yourselves if anyone wants to ask a question. If you are not asking a question, it might be helpful if you could mute yourself so that we don't hear a lot of background. Testing. I hear someone testing. <laughs> Is that you, Chad? So, Nadia, this is Roger Kern. Hello. Great, great uh, information here. I have a question. Has anybody really trying, I know Iowa was, trying to figure out what those compounds are that are so smelly? Well, yeah, I mean, in, in the previous, in one of the slides that I showed, uh, you know, that Iowa State Research Project, 231 compounds, not all of them smelled, um, but there were 34 that had never been identified as being odorous, that they identified as odorous, but low concentration. So that's 31 of the one that we, of what we knew before. Uh, plus another 34. So that's what, 65 at least that we know of that uh, create an odor, whether they're in high, low, or medium concentration. Um, if you're interested in any of the papers that we've presented, uh, we can also um, forward those to you. Just ask us and we can send them. Oh, yeah, I'd like, I'd, like it very much. I'd like to see those very much. Uh, just trying to think. The peaks you're you're just not seeing on the mass spec that are causing the other. Is that true? Yeah, Some that is very true. So one thing to point out too for um, the just for the Colorado study that I'm conducting when we're looking at you know VOC terpene profiles, because the focus is our of our study is focused on what are the impacts to ozone we were really we focused on so a select group of terpenes that we know are both highly reactive for ozone formation and are associated with cannabis so versus this iowa study where they have you know they're looking at you know 230 compounds we really just focused on what are the you know the high concentrations associated with cannabis and the influence ozone so the odor question is, is, is yet to be, you know, more research is needed on that for sure. Okay, so, thank, Roger, thank if you. Roger, if you look at this graph, uh, you know, above the x-axis is, mm -hmm. the, you know, what they were able to measure with mass spec, and below uh, the x-axis is what people smelled. And this is that C category where oh. there was nothing detectable by mass spec, but people smelled it really strongly look as strong as these already known odorous compounds which look are in really high concentrations we know they're there we can smell them we can measure them but there's this whole subset where we can smell them but we can't measure them um say there's a company called saint croix sensory 
um, that is looking into researching like the cannabis odor a lot more and quantifying, you know, what are those, you know, non-reactive terpenes, maybe they aren't even terpenes, maybe they're more sulfur-based compounds, you know, what are yeah. the compounds that contribute to the odor? Um, yeah, St. Croix Sensory is, is looking into that. Yeah, I'll check that out. Thank you very much. Thanks, Roger. Anyone else? I have a question for you. Go ahead. Yeah, shoot. It's Derek with Cannabusters. What a great presentation. Thank you, ladies, so much. Uh, good to see you, Caitlin. Good to see you, uh, Derek. Well, hear from you. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Um, so the question I have, and of course the conversation is around VOCs and odor resulting from cannabis operations. Um, I just want everybody to know that my product eliminates VOCs and odor by oxidation. And I would love to work with anybody who's having a challenge and take all these things off your plate so you don't have to worry about them. And in that oxidation process, are you, is any ozone being generated? The oxidative agent in Cannabusters is active iodine 2. Which is the same stuff that comes down in rain because plant life in the ocean generates it and makes it smell clean when it rains, among other things. Uh, so I don't know, honestly, but I do know that the oxidative process involves stripping out the hydrogen piece of every molecule of VOC touched and eliminating the odor because the molecule no longer is what it was. And the VOC is also eliminated at the same time. Wonderful. Yep. We have third party studies to show that information, by the way. Awesome. And if anyone needs help um, getting in contact with Derek of Cannabusters, um, we can provide you with that contact if you know if you email us through the, the webinar information. Um, we've got a great, great question on the chat box. Um, has ozone generation in Denver increased since cannabis legalization? And the answer to that is yes, but it's also really hard to tie how much um, is tied to cannabis legalization because back in 2014 when we had recreational legalization, that's really when we had the big boom of, of cannabis cultivation in Colorado. Prior to that, we had um, medical cannabis, you know, that which started in about 2000, I think 10 or 11. Um, but really the boom didn't take off until recreational in 2014, but a lot of other things also happened in our state in 2014. We had a really large oil and gas boom, which brought um, a, a lot more emissions to our state that contribute to ozone, but also that also brought with it a population influx. Denver has mm. seen an intense population influx since 2014. Um, highly, highly intense. So all those people are contributing also to, you know, cars on the road, um, you know, power generation. And so it's, it's really hard to say, you know, yes, we have had a, a large increase um, in, in ozone, but we've also had an increase in concentrations. But then at the same time, we've had a lot more regulations that have come into play within that time period as well. So for instance, um, as a result of the oil and gas boom, we have some of the most stringent oil and gas regulations in the nation. Colorado's oil and gas regulations are more stringent than the federal regulations. So that has brought those, um, you know, those concentrations down, which has brought down our ozone a little bit. But, you know, it's, it's really, ozone is hard because it's not a direct pollutant versus, you know, back in the day, say, when we had a lead pollution problem here in Colorado, um, you know, we weren't meeting lead standards. It, it was, it's kind of a widespread issue. We were able to solve that with one action. We banned lead and gasoline. That was the major source of lead in all of Colorado. And so by taking that one regulatory step, we solved the problem. It's not going to happen with ozone because there's so many contributors and it's twofold. There's all the nitrogen oxide contributors and there's all the volatile organic contributors. Um, and so those two things together are what creates ozone formation. And then also too, 
Um, weather comes into play with, with this a lot, and, and especially here in Colorado, the way that we're set up with, we have you know a mountain region and all of our population is butted right up against that mountain region. And so our weather patterns kind of force this mixing, that circular mixing that happens right above, you know, our most populous areas of the state because weather comes in, hits the mountains, and then is kind of circulated um, around our most populous areas. So, you know, we have a lot of our agricultural areas up to the north and to the south, and then a lot of, you know, our, our city center right in the middle of our state. And when you get these weather patterns that cause this mixing, all of a sudden, you know, these agricultural emissions that are way far away from the city get mixed and deposited right above the city and mixed with that nitrogen oxide and then create this regional ozone issue. So it's really hard to pinpoint how to control ozone. Um, it's not an easy problem. <laughs> wow, that is super interesting. Yeah, air sheds see no boundaries. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, in water quality, I, I used to work in um, drinking water and I'm kind of envious sometimes of my old job and colleagues is that they get to work within a very defined system. Yeah. You've got a pipe that's controlled by a treatment plant on one end and you're delivering to the customer on the other. And you have a very, you know, finite system to work in treatment and mitigation and all of that. Well, when we're talking about our air shed and people emitting into the air, I mean, if you don't control it before it's emitted, it's, it's just kind of in this wide spread hmm. soup that gets mixed with all of our, um, you know, our weather patterns. Wow. Interesting. And it's also not, I mean, it doesn't even see bounds from country to country. I mean, we've seen when, when other countries experience, you know, air quality disasters, like the fires in Australia, we saw impacts in Colorado. Um, you know, we had increased particulate levels um, in Colorado as a result of fires that happened on the other side of the world. I guess that doesn't really surprise me, but still, wow. Yeah. So any other odor questions? <laughs> Great conversation. <laughs> hey, Nadia, it's Mike Zartarian. I have a quick question. Um, about, so in, in, within buildings, can you discuss about using uh, regulating pressure, you know, using positive and negative pressure to kind of direct your air, you know, the smelly odor through the carbon filter. Because I feel, my experience a lot of times when there are odor problems, it's, there may be odor mitigation in place, but the odor is leaking out of some other uh, portion of the building because it's being pushed out. I was wondering, yeah, just comment on on that, that aspect right. of it. Right. Um, so, you know, I, I had mentioned that the California Fire Code was requiring now these facilities to be negatively pressurized, which in my opinion, uh, we should be positively pressurizing, especially the cultivation rooms and areas, because we want to treat it like a clean room. We don't want to be sucking in dirty air from corridors and from other places within the building. But regardless, you know, of whether we're creating positive or negative pressure in, say, the cultivation room, we still have the opportunity to direct that air where we want it to go through the exhaust duct or exhaust fan, um, it, unless you are recirculating air, which you know I usually would not recommend um, in high volumes. But you know, air is tricky because it is hard to get air to go to where you want it to go. Uh, you know, it's really forced by high pressure differentials. It gets affected by temperature gradients. It get, gets affected by vapor pressure differences. It gets affected by fans. It gets affected by a person walking into the room. So really getting air to go to where you want it to go, you have to create a high differential in pressure using a fan. So what I like to do, if I'm using carbon filters, is if I think that I'm in a building that is, or a room that's not well sealed. So for instance, a greenhouse is a perfect example. I actually like to put recirculating carbon filters near any entrances, near any of the exterior uh, envelope surfaces where I think odor is most likely to escape. So if you are in an indoor facility and that door opens and closes, you have a door that opens and closes into a corridor, uh, that might not have odor control, put a carbon filter uh, 
right over that door or right next to that door or have an exhaust fan that's right next to that door so that you can direct the air in the direction that you want it to go and then run it through say you know that that uv and then that carbon filter and then out uh, the building with an exhaust fan so being sort of strategic thinking where could air possibly escape this room or this building and putting fans there or putting you know carbon filters or some other mitigating uh, technologies in that area um, and you know being able to positively pressurize a space is actually a little bit easier to control the directionality of that air as well so you know you could almost double up on the fans or have a fan that's blowing air say from the the production room into that corridor so you create that positive pressure and move the air away from an exterior wall and more in towards the center of that building and then you have an exhaust fan for instance in that corridor that then has say an inline carbon filter or maybe you have carbon filters lining that corridor. Again, it's so hard because we don't have good data on how many carbon filters we need for a given volume of air. And on, I mean, someone just has to figure this out. This cannot be that hard. <laughs> well, and it's um, going to highly depend on yeah. like the, as you showed, the chemical makeup of the carbon filter that you're right. dealing with. Um, right. And also these specific emissions that you're trying to control. I mean, it's going to be different. Um, the carbon filters designed for cannabis, you know, may be different than what's used at Absolutely. You know, a hog farm. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, I, I asked because it just seems to be the, the amount of smell that comes out of a facility doesn't always seem to be correlated to the odor mitigation that's been in place mm -hmm. and a lot of times that's yeah, just because it's you know the, the harvest team has pulled a thousand plants and is deleafing them in a hallway that has no odor mitigation because exactly. we spent all the time yeah yep. odor yes. mitigation. Well, very thank you. good point very good point um and sometimes you know that's that's something to point out is that sometimes these cannabis businesses um you know when they work with the odor con you know whoever's going to be their odor control consultants they need to be really transparent about their operational procedures. I mean, as a as an engineer coming in, they may look at the process and without, you know, people being there to say, this is how we operate our business um, and this is how we function, they wouldn't necessarily think to put, you know, um, carbon filters down the hallway, which would they probably think that's just a walkway. But, you know, well, from uh, noon to three o'clock every day, it becomes our trim room, um, yeah. which is common. Any maybe, other lingering questions? Yeah, maybe another question. It's 11.30, so. We can wrap um, up for you guys, but. Yeah, we're happy grateful to be for you to stick around with us for so long today. And hey, we kept the internet connection, or at least I did, and yeah. you did. <laughs> I think we lost some people along the way who kept, uh, needed to, to be readmitted, but um, yeah, not, not too many technical difficulties today. I'm grateful for that. Right. Hey, ladies. Yes. Hi, this Bruce. is Bruce Strawn in Denver. Hi. Am I echoing? No. Okay. I got I got a question about the the nitty gritty of all this. I mean, it seems like there there's at this point we don't have the technology to take the the human subjectivity out of it. Um, I'm actually have a. Uh, Unless they, we're talking uh, about right, with <laughs> town in Massachusetts is actually trying to write their odor law. <laughs> so basically what I've been telling them is this, um, you know, the nasal ranger with that 71 ratio. I mean, that works well for certain industries, but it not for uh, cannabis. Cause even if it passes that standard, it could still be a, a major odor problem. So I think it, yeah. ultimately it really comes down to, uh, the nose of the inspector. I mean, right? I mean, if they um, are investigating an odor complaint, they're they're going to look and see if you know if everything in the odor control plan is being followed. Um, but ultimately, if if there's really a a violation or not, I mean, it really ultimately it's going to come down to the to the nose of the inspectors. Is that right? 
The nose of the inspectors and also the regulatory structure that put up. So like here in Colorado, it's actually, you know, it, we tried to take as much human error out of it as possible with the every six month certification programs that your, your nose has to be, you know, calibrated to a certain sensitivity in order for you to be able to be an inspector um, certified to use the nasal ranger. And then once you use the nasal ranger from that seven to one ratio, it's not an opinion of what you smell, if it's gross or if you like it or not, or any of that, none of that comes into play. It's just, is there a presence or absence of odor through that seven to one ratio filter? And with marijuana and you know cannabis, um, because it's such low concentrations of VOCs causing that high olfactory response, that seven parts of air through the carbon filter, that carbon filter is easily going to capture those odor causing molecules and marijuana is almost never going to cause a violation above seven to one through the nasal ranger. Mm. Um, and, and because of its low quantity, high odorous compounds. And so like for Colorado, you know, the marijuana, the odor statewide odor regulation based on the seven to one ratio doesn't really address marijuana. I mean, a, as a state agency, you know, after years of going out to these marijuana complaints um, and doing the nasal ranger and in response to the marijuana odor complaints and never getting a violation, um, rarely do we send out uh, a nasal ranger unless it's, you know, a really high profile situation. Most of the time we just explain that our seven to one statewide odor ordinance isn't going, marijuana is not gonna be strong enough to violate that. Um, and then we, we pretty much offer uh, odor control practices for both the complainant and the violator, you know, we'll reach out and say, hey, you know, do you have carbon filters? Can you install them? You've got neighbors complaining, um, but oftentimes it just comes down to, that's not covered by regulation, I mean, um, we had one instance where we had um, a concentrate manufacturer, like a wholesale concentrate manufacturer. So using those uh, solvents for extraction um, was located right next to um, an assisted living, like an, an old folks home. I don't know the proper term for that, but essentially um, the residents, you know, were really upset about the marijuana smells. And after, you know, investigation, it wasn't an odor violation on the facility, but they decided to electively add odor controls to be good neighbors, um, you know, to this the assisted living facility. So it's it's evolving, and you're right. I don't know if we can really take human error out of of assessing odors. You know, there could start to be you know more regulations written around VOC concentration and VOC profile. But then, even if we control those VOCs, we might not be controlling those odorous compounds. So it's it's kind of an overlapping issue that's really hard to quantify. I mean, I've been in with CDPHE for 10 years in a regulatory capacity and, um, you know, cannabis odors has been one of those kind of ongoing unsolved, how do we address this? <laughs> sure, sounds like we just uh, really need more research in the area. Yeah, and more research, I would say, more research, um, and also along with that research, knowledge sharing and really helping people understand what the research is and the implications of it. Um, for instance, you know, there was a, a really great study that came out of um, University of North Carolina earlier this year, I think it was published in, in February, um, about the potential, you know, VOC emissions in resulting um, ozone profile um, that could have been Great, great study, a lot of respect for that study, but the way it was done was it was done, you know, indoors, um, it, plants they grew themselves in a, in a non-controlled um, grow environment, basically in a cold garage with improper lighting, improper nutrients, and then once they got that VOC emission profile, they had to make assumptions about, you know, the industry, and, and some of the assumptions were, you know, what if every facility had 10,000 plants? That's really high. You know, what if every plant produced two to five pounds of product? It's really high. And so all these assumptions kind of added up to a range of impact on ozone, which I kind of classify as, you know, zero to plant apocalypse. Um, <laughs> and as, you know, as government agents and as regulators, we got to look at how these studies are done and really try to understand them. And that's, you know, one of the driving forces behind my study is we have to partner with industry to understand it, to hone in on what is that impact. You know, the UNC study I look at is a great first study. It says, yes, 
there are VOCs coming off of plants and those VOCs are reactive for ozone formation, but the extent of it, we, we have to put more research into how we quantify that. Um, and then also working with other government agencies to share that information and, you know, helping folks, you know, up in Canada understand these different studies and, and how they were done and, and maybe the different regulatory approaches that states are taking and, you know, why is Colorado sort of lagging on controlling marijuana odors? Um, well, it's because we have more research to do and our current odor structure doesn't address um, the industry. All right, thanks. That's uh, very helpful, Caitlin, and thanks a lot, Nadia. Yeah, thanks for coming. All right, I think we should probably uh, wrap it up unless anyone has a super burning question. You guys have our contact information. Please um, follow up with an email or a phone call. Uh, if you have any additional questions or thoughts or um, uh, have questions about uh, some of the resources uh, that we talked about today. Caitlin, thank you so much for being our special guest today. I learned a lot from you and I think a bunch of people did too. So thank you uh, for hosting and making, you know, it, it available to everyone. Pretty powerful that we can have um, such an in-depth conversation that could have wide sweeping impacts, you know, from the comfort of my living room. I know, right? <laughs> All right. Well, thanks everyone for joining us and uh, we will follow up with you with, uh, the, with the webinar, with the slides and um, yeah, please, please stay in touch. All right. Have, have a great Tuesday. Thank you so much, ladies.